Thank you. Uh, 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 wait a minute. She's not ready. Hold on. That's okay. You can keep going. Thank you, Cheyenne. Nice slippers. All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, could you turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. And also in your songbooks, if you could turn to uh, page 168. Uh, the song, There Is Nothing Sweeter, we're going to do for that as a congregational song. So, page 168 in your songbooks and Exodus chapter 33, verse 1 in your Bibles. Uh, just a, a few announcements before we get it underway. Um, if you could keep in prayer, Bill and Crystal, they don't feel well, they're online, so keep them in prayer. And uh, wait till I tell you what Tony said to you about you guys. I just want you to know. And also, I don't know where she is, probably cooking, but Jody's birthday is Tuesday, so make sure you... Uh, Give your uh, happy birthday wishes to Jody. And uh, also our class schedule is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, from 7 to 8 here. Uh, and also uh, that uh, prayer meeting is on Thursday evenings after class. We're doing the book of Daniel. That's going really well. And also, of course, Sunday we're doing Exodus. And we'll be going to a New Testament book once we're done with Exodus. Um, our, our, our website is www. Wenstrom.org, and all of our uh, classes are recorded and videoed, and we put them on the website. But also, we have the written article. We have various written articles on different subjects of theology and different books that we've studied. So, like for instance, Exodus. We have uh, well, when I finish Exodus chapter thirty-three, I'll put out. Um, I'll put up on our website. I'll give it to Titus, and he'll put on the site this uh, article on Exodus. So. Uh, so a lot of these written articles that we do uh, on the subjects that we're teaching here have more information in them because there's only so much I can put in in an hour. Uh, so uh, like a lot of details as far as the original language is, especially with Daniel. And uh, so there's a lot, uh, a lot of stuff on the website, over a thousand articles. Take advantage of it. We don't charge for our teachings. We're a great ministry. Uh, basically, we're having faith that God will provide for our needs. Even th- and so I don't charge for my materials. One of the reasons why I don't charge for materials and I put this reason on our on our website, is that there are some people who just can't afford, you know, twenty bucks to go pick up a book at a Christian bookstore or something. And so, um, like people, a lot of people from Africa, or the Philippines, go to our website, and there are a lot of pastors. From uh, I got another guy who's on our list, another pastor who's on our email list, and basically these people can't afford anything like we can. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't charge for mat- my, uh, our materials. The other reason is that we're not to be peddling the Word of God. We should make it uh, make it uh, free of charge, uh, and uh, we shouldn't be putting a price on it. I know other pastors do. That's between them and God. But my conviction is what the passage, uh, the Bible says, is we can't be charging for our teaching, and um, so uh, that's why I don't do it. So. Um, also, if, you know, obviously Jesus and the apostles, I don't think they went to a city and said, well, I'll buy my book at 2095. You know, I don't, they didn't do that. So, um, so basically that means we have to have, we as pastors have to have faith that the body, the Holy Spirit will work through members of the body of Christ to provide for uh, this ministry, provide for, you know, we all make a living. We expect to get paid for what we're doing. And as we saw in First Timothy and other passages, those who proclaim the gospel are to get their living from the gospel. So we're a grace ministry. That means not for free. It costs us money to put all these things out and time and everything and effort. But uh, so it's uh, the body of Christ's obligation to uh, provide for uh, the pastor as it's taught in the Word of God. And also, uh, that with that being said, we're going to, uh, I said before, we're going to continue our study of the book of Exodus. We're going to talk about the about intimacy with God because we're going to see Moses in contrast to the other Israelites who are involved in idolatry. Moses is on intimate terms with God. So we'll have a lot to say about intimacy uh, with God this morning, which is a very, very important subject for the body of Christ to hear. So uh, without further ado, let's take... Uh, a moment of, you know, why don't we just, you know, I know it's Tuesday, but why don't we sing happy birthday first of all to Jody because, you know, we have more people here on, on, on during the week. So everybody, let's sing happy birthday to Jody. She's going to be really mad now. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jody. Happy birthday to you. She takes care of all of us, so we thank God for her every day. So uh, congratulations, Jody. 
And uh, so let's take that moment of silent prayer. So with our heads, uh, we, remember when we take the silent prayer, we're, we're first of all to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any known sin, 1 John 1, 9. Then we stay in fellowship uh, through obedience to the word of God. That's when we're filled with the spirit, which is commanded of us in Ephesians 5, 18. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is indeed a great honor and privilege that we can uh, gather together with other members of the body of Christ and to worship you, your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we, we have no merit with you. We stand before you based upon your grace policy, treating us better than we deserve, saving us based upon the merits of the object of our faith, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives from regeneration to resurrection, and in particular, when he appropriated uh, all that your son has done for us through his death and resurrection and appropriated it for us, uh, giving us the victory over sin and Satan at the moment of our conversion when we had faith in your son and the Holy Spirit uh, regenerating us and identifying us with your son and his death and resurrection. So help us, Father, each, uh, every day to draw closer to you, to walk by faith in your word and thus to be obedient to your word. Help us to understand the reason and the meaning and the purpose for which you created and, s and saved us. So that, w namely, to uh, be worshiping you and serving you and being dedicated and devoted to you. It's only right that we do so because you sent your son to the cross for us when we were your enemies. And when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, you raised us up and seated us with your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to draw closer to you. Give us insight and illumination into the great power and love that has been directed toward us through our identification with your son, Jesus Christ. And pr pray, Father, that also that you would help us to have a humble heart, help us to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction in our lives with godly people speaking to us and the word of God speaking to us and circumstances that you control speaking to us. Help us to hear your voice and not to be hard-hearted. We pray, Father, that you would uh, also uh, continue to raise up positive volition in the body of Christ whether it's in this ministry or other ministries throughout this country and the world, we pray that you would break down any barriers sin and Satan has put up that is hindering that from happening. And we pray for the spiritual and temporal needs of uh, other ministries throughout this country and the world. And Father, we lift up our leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for President Obama and his cabinet. And we pray that you give our military and political leaders the wisdom and the moral courage to lead this country, and uh, especially with the situations uh, all around uh, the globe and the anti-American sentiment out there. So we just pray, Father, that you would, uh, with the these in individuals that are involved in the radical aspect of Islam, we pray, Father, that you would uh, glorify yourself and expose them to the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. And we know that uh, even though these people might be antagonistic toward uh, the Jewish people and also toward Christians and the Bible and Jesus Christ, and we know that some of your servants over in the Middle East who believed in your son, Jesus Christ, are being killed and suffering torture at the hands of these people. But we know through the example of your servant Paul who actually persecuted Christians and was the chief of sinners and led the charge against you and your church that you saved him. And we know that you could save these people too that are out there that are antagonistic to the Bible and your son Jesus Christ and Christians. So help us as Christians to pray for these people and not fall into the trap of the devil and hating these people. Help us to show unconditional love toward them and to pray for them that, that you would bring in whatever circumstances, people, blessings, adversity necessary, that they'd see their need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that their religion is a deception like all the religions of this world and help Christians not to be involved in political correctness, that they would uh, be speaking the truth in love and grace but standing firm and not backing down and not being ashamed of the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. 
We also, we thank you, Father, uh, for this ministry and this little flock that you've given us. And we just pray, Father, that you would, uh, with, uh, with your power, glorify yourself in this ministry. Uh, Father, we thank you for those who are in the Thompson household. We thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home to us. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are on Pal Talk and on the website. We thank you for each and every one of them. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would work mightily and powerfully in this service uh, this morning. And we pray that you, was, you and your son, Jesus Christ, would be magnified. We also pray that everyone would be humble. Help us all to be objective and to be uh, carefully considering the passages and principles we'll be noting here this morning. We pray, Father, that you would help everyone to understand and make proper application. And we also pray that you would break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder people from hearing the word and listening to it and applying it. We also pray the same for the communicator, that he would, uh, that you would break down any barriers with regards to him that would hinder him from speaking with boldness and power and, and reverence and respect for your word. Uh, help him also to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We also pray that the song service would bring glory to you, that people would sing, um, un- uh, not being self-conscious, but singing to you and being concerned about pleasing you and your son. We pray that you would give Titus and Tyler wisdom with the sound and the recordings. And we thank you for their service and the technology that you've given us so that we could reach around the globe and not just here in this country and in Iowa. And Father, we pray for these things in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Could you all rise, please? And and on page 168, we're going to do There Is Nothing Sweeter for a Congregational Song. There is nothing sweeter than to taste your word of grace To gain a knowledge of your word is to see the Savior's face to read about who you are has brought me so much joy there is nothing sweeter than to learn your word each day to understand the word of truth is to find the words to pray to search and know the will of God is through the word of life. Oh, your word's my daily bread, living my life by all that you have said. Oh, your word's my guide and light It teaches me What's wrong and what is right There is nothing sweeter than your word that's tried and true It reveals the future things in all that you will do to look into the mind of Christ has made my life complete oh your words incomparable doing what men think is impossible oh your words omnipotent it's saving souls and so magnificent there is nothing sweeter than your word that is so pure heaven and earth will pass away but your word it will endure 
forever I will praise your word for all that he has done there is nothing sweeter than your word there is nothing sweeter than your word mm -hmm. I love your word you may be seated we're going to do another song Tyler Okay, this uh, we're going to do King of Kings and Lord of Lords on page 94. If you know it, you can sing it along. If you don't, sit back and relax. Listen to me, all my people Heaven is my throne And all the earth is my footstool I'm the head of all the nations Don't you live in fear of anyone Cause I still rule Cause I'm the king of kings Listen to me, all my people Don't you let your hearts be troubled But believe in me I'm the head and you're the body Soon you'll be my bride For I will come and set you free Cause I'm the king of kings Shall bow to me Every tongue Will confess That I am Lord All my enemies Shall fall By the word From my mouth That is my sword Of God's children Sing for John
just do this. All right, if you should, could you turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33, verse 1, if you haven't already. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. All right, well, as I said before in the announcements, this uh, class that we'll be noting here this morning in Exodus chapter 33 is uh, basically presenting to us, in verse, we'll be noting verses 7 through 11 in this chapter. These verses uh, give us a stark contrast between Moses and the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites, remember the nation had gone into, lapsed into idolatry. Uh, they worshipped the young golden bull as we saw in Exodus chapter 32. They were severely disciplined. We saw the unrepentant uh, Israelites. Uh, they were disciplined. They died the sin unto death. By the way, as we said before, in many cl different classes in the past, these were all believers. They died the sin unto death. And so they died the most severe uh, form of divine discipline that God could administer to his children. And so these uh, individuals were put to death because they refused to stop their idolatry. And then we see that God, in, in order to uh, impress upon the Israelites his dissatisfaction with them and also uh, their, to show them the significance of their great sin of, of committing this gross idolatry, he is going to, as we'll see this morning, he's going to park himself, God is, with Moses, he's going to park himself outside the camp of the Israelites. He's not going to dwell in their midst, but he, of course, later on, we'll see he does come back in. But the, today, in order to, we'll see that God is going to, in order to teach the Israelites the seriousness of their sin, he's going to uh, 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 meet people outside the Israelite camp because he says, if I went up to the land of Canaan with you, I would destroy you on the way because you're an obstinate people. So we're going to see, uh, uh, in contrast to the God's Israel uh, attitude to the Israelites, we're going to see that uh, God has a great relationship with Moses, and the, the, it quite uh, frankly comes right down to this. Moses was more obedient and put more effort into his relationship with God. And of course, this is a great, uh, great uh, class for, uh, you'll find this morning for yourselves and myself, is that uh, it teaches us in the church the principle about getting intimate with God. And everybody uh, has that ab ab ability to have intimacy with God, and it all comes down to your, what's most important in your life. Uh, as people, things, um, relationships, possessions, are they more uh, uh, appropriation, uh, approbation from men and women? Is that most important to you? Is it money more important to you, or is your relationship with God most important to you? And those who, God is the most important uh, uh, aspect of his, their life, they're going to be rewarded. Uh, we see this uh, concept of uh, God discriminating uh, between his people. For instance, Moses. In the relation to the Israelites, Moses is more, on more intimate terms than the other Israelites. We get to the Gospels. You see Jesus taking Peter, James, and John with him to the mountain of transfiguration. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the most, uh, uh, one of the greatest moments in uh, pressure on the Lord's life in his first advent, and he took Peter, James, and John. Not all the disciples came to the Garden of Gethsemane with, me, with him. And that's because God, uh, the Lord discriminated uh, those who were closest to him, Peter, James, and John, they're the ones he took. And so this is what God does. He, he revealed, you know, what we talk about friendship. Um, Jesus said this in the, uh, he taught this in the, in the Upper Room Discourse in John 13, chapters 13 through 17. He said, you know, he, he said to them, you know, I'll, I want to be, fr he wanted to be friends with, uh, with them, the disciples, but it all stemmed from their staying in fellowship with him, which is based upon obedience to him. And he talked about that you know, being friends. Well, friends, what are friends? Uh, it's different than acquaintances, because a lot, most people we call friends are, in our day and age, in our society, are really acquaintances. Friends, fr friendship is where you are sharing things with each other that you would not share with other people. God's the same way. He doesn't uh, reveal himself in, uh, in, in intimate terms to the uh, a person when they don't want to have anything to do with him, or that they they're not, uh, they're not putting enough evidence in their relationship with him. He only reveals himself and gives himself greater insight into his character and nature and his will and ways to those who seek him. Those who diligently seek him will find him. And not all Christians are doing that. So this class is going to be great because hopefully it motivates us. And also, uh, we, have to we have to look at this. You know, we have to be honest with ourselves. If, you if we deceive ourselves and think we're on intimate terms with God and we're not, and we, he's the most important thing in our life, and we're not, he's not, uh, we're only kidding ourselves. As I pointed out before, when I, as an analogy, if I go out and play golf, and uh, go out and play golf, and I hit the ball, 
And I, I hit it into the woods, and I take a mulligan, you know. And Titus knows what I'm talking about. Take a mulligan, you know. You hit, when you play with the Wenstrom, you got to take one mulligan once, in, you know, once in a while. But, 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 so I've, I've, you know, and, and you know, guys take number of shots, and then they go, you go there, and you get to the, you know, after the hole, and they say, oh, I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a bogey. You, you just shot, you just, you, just, you had about ten back there. But you know, some guys they kid themselves. So every golfer pretty much goes through the same thing. You, you got to kid, you kid yourself, and you lie about your score to yourself. Now, now everybody knows, except, unless you play with somebody, they know. But you know, you're just kidding yourself. God knows what you did. So if you're lousy, you're lousy. So what I'm saying to you is, if I go and I, I shoot, I, I mark down that I had a, a par when I actually had a triple bogey on a par five. Um, I'm only kidding myself, and, and you know you're you're kidding yourself. So. Uh, the best thing is to do is mark down the score that you have, and you're only going to get better if you face up to the fact that you're not good, okay? So if I go out there and I say, I think I'm good and I'm not, I'm never going to get better. It's the same thing in anything in life. If you think you're a great engineer and you're not, and, you know, and you know you're not, but you kid yourself that you are, well, you know, you're only hurting yourself. You need to be objective and say, I stink, I need to get better. And it's the same thing with, uh, it's the same thing with uh, whatever you do in life, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, whatever you do in life, you drive a truck, I mean, you're a teacher, whatever you do, you got to be uh, dead uh, ser- uh, objective with yourself and serious and be honest with yourself. And it, most important, we have to be serious and honest about our relationship with God. Are we really dedicated and devoted to him as we think we are? We claim we are. One of the, the biggest things a Christian has to wor- worry about is self-deception everybody because we have to look at we have to measure ourselves in light of the word of god not by our own standards or other people's standards but by our by, by god's standards which are found in his word he said we're to love him with all our heart soul mind and strength and our neighbor is ourself but the first part to love the lord thy god with all thy heart soul mind and strength that's very important we understand that. Your entire being is what needs to be involved in your relationship with God. So this morning, we're going to note verses 33, chapter 33 of the book of Exodus, verses 7 through 11, which reveal to us that Moses was on intimate terms with the Lord. Now look at Exodus chapter 33, and look at verse 1, please. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land of Canaan, saying, to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, which we pointed out was the pre-incarnate Christ. The word angel there is not talking about some being that's uh, higher than men. It's actually talking about the pre-incarnate Christ. The word Balak, as we saw in Scripture, can refer to Jesus Christ before he became a man in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, uh, a visible or auditory appearance of him, or it can actually, uh, sometimes the person is, a, is a, a human being, and sometimes it's someone like uh, Gabriel or Michael, someone who is uh, a, a, of a, a, a being created by God that is abo- below God, yet above mankind. Now, the word actually there means messenger, okay? So remember that. So I'll send my messenger before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. These are all the inhabitants of Canaan. Go up, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. Very important we see this. Because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. Later, he gives him grace. Uh, later on, he ends up, when they build the tabernacle, he ends up dwelling in their midst in the tabernacle once they build it. Now, here, he's not doing that right now because he's trying to teach them about the seriousness of their sin and worshiping this golden young bull. So it says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. Because he's holy and he doesn't tolerate uh, behavior that's contrary to him and his character. Verse 4, when the people heard this sad word that he wasn't going up in their midst, they went into mourning and none of them put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the sons of Israel, you're an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment? I would destroy you. Now, this is, the, as was pointed out, this is the Father talking. Now, the pre-incarnate Christ is going to go ahead of them. Now, why is it all right for the Father uh, to not be going up in their midst and it's all right for the Son to go with them? Well, because the Father is that member of the Trinity that is basically the judge. He's the one who is, and the Son is the one who's always trying, is the one who reconciles or is the intermediary between sinners and a holy God. 
So he try, God's trying to teach the Israelites something and us here, here in the church age. Look at verse 5. For the Lord has said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You're an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore, put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Mount Horeb is a synonym for Mount Sinai. Verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. As we'll see, this is not the tabernacle. The tabernacle hasn't been built yet. This is another tent, as we'll see. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Now notice, God has not completely cut them off. He's saying, you can meet up with me. You have a question, whatever. You can come to me, but I'm outside the camp. I'm not going to dwell in your midst. So he has, and Moses is again the intermediary. So therefore, he has not cut off total communication with the Israelites. It's kind of like uh, you, when you deal with your kids, okay? When you punish your kids and you want to make, you send them to their room, right? So you're trying to make a point. You haven't cut off communication with them, okay? But you're, make, you're making a point with them that you're upset with them. This is what God's doing with the Israelites, just like you would do with your family. Look at verse 8. And it came about, whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship and each at the entrance of his tent. But that would be like you and I standing in front of our homes. Look at verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the, this, the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now in verse 3, remember we read in verse 3, the Lord told Moses, I'm not going to go up in your midst because... You're an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way, on the way to Canaan. In verse 5, we read, he instructed, the Lord instructed Moses to communicate this to the Israelites, and they were sad when they heard this. They were depressed. Now, here in verse 7, as we just read, we have Moses moving the tent, from, uh, tent of meeting from the midst of the Israelite camp, and he pitches it outside the camp, a good distance from the Israelite camp. And uh, that's because the Lord said, I will destroy them on the way, therefore I can't dwell in their midst. Because he was very upset with them. Now, in verses 7 through 11, as I pointed out earlier, these verses stand in contrast to the six verses, first six verses. Because in the former, the first, uh, verses 7 through 11, we have, uh, th these verses reveal that God was pleased with Moses. And then in verses 1 through 6, we have God voicing his displeasure with the Israelites. So there's a contrast between Moses and the Israelites. Moses has talked about his intimacy with the Lord, is talked about in verses 7 through 11. That stands in contrast to the first six verses where God's voicing his, to Moses his displeasure to, of the Israelites. Now in verses 7 through 11, those verses reveal that Moses and the Lord were on intimate terms, whereas the latter, verses 1 through 6, the Israelites, they have a strained relationship between, there's a strained relationship in these verses between the Israelites and the Lord. So again, Moses was on intimate terms with the Lord. Why? Because of his obedience. And his obedience stems from his faith. Remember, faith produces obedience. Faith in God's word produces obedience to his word. Per people who are involved in unbelief are disobedient to God. And the Israelite, uh, the Exodus generation is a classic example of their unbelief as manifested in their disobedience to God, their complaining, their rejection of God's authority and his delegated authority, Moses. Uh, all over the place, the Exodus generation demonstrated they had no faith in the Lord and they were disobedient to him. So what's intimacy? Well, intimacy uh, is a, a close, uh, familiar, very important, close, familiar, and usually affectionate or loving personal relationship with another person or group. Now, in relation to people, intimacy is a close association with a detailed knowledge or deep understanding of a person. So let's apply it to God. Moses 
had a deep understanding of the person of God, the character of God, his will and his ways. And he, remember, he, we'll see in chapter 34, and we'll actually see it at the end of chapter 33. Moses wants to know more about God. Now stop and ask yourself a question. What is your attitude about your God? Is your, only it's a rhetorical question. Play, play poker. Ask yourself this question. Do I know my God in detailed knowledge about him? Am I? And the only way you can do that is through the word of God. And the people who know their Bible are the, and, and put it into practice are the closest. They have a detailed and close relationship with God. You can, you can, you can see it in people. You, you, you look at certain people and you wonder why uh, they're able to, you can see it when they go through adversity. You wonder how are they able to handle that adversity? Most people would have folded up their tent and, and rolled over and died. They don't. Why is that? People like Paul went through all kinds of adversity. Timothy. How do they, how do they maintain that uh, enthusiasm with their relationship with God? It's because their relationship with God was the most important thing in their life. Not people, not things, not their home, not their jobs, not their businesses, not their wives or their husbands or their children. It was the Lord. Abraham. We, start, we bring up his example all the time. How much, did God, how much was uh, Abraham's relationship with God important to him? He was willing to sacrifice his son that he loved dearly, that he waited for his whole life. He was willing to sacrifice that son in obedience to God. That tells you that for Abraham, his relationship with God was more important than his son. That's a serious thing we got to think about because Every single one of us in this room, everyone is listening to my voice, and everyone who gets our stuff on the, listens to this class on, on the website or listens to it on CV, CD from us, this is very important, every single one you listen to, is that nothing, nothing comes ahead of your relationship with God. Not people, not your wife, not your kids. And yet, this is going on among God's people all the time, where the wife or the husband or the job of the business or the kids are more important than being dedicated and devoted to God. Your attitude toward the word of God deter is a manifestation of, whether, which of your attitude toward God. Because the word of God has been inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaks to us through, the Lord speaks to us through the word of God. So if your attitude toward the word of God is it's the most important thing in my life, Man does not live on bread alone, but from every uh, does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is that saying? God's word, which is His method of communicating with His people, that has to what it says has to be most important in our life. And you have to be honest with yourself, because there are a lot of Christians who are just dead killing, kidding themselves. They're not close with the Lord. They don't know. They don't know basic things in the Word of God. They don't know their Bible. And, it's, and I'll tell you right now, it ain't because of my, my failure as a, a teaching the Word of God because I'm out there teaching four times a week and get a website that's 24-7. So, and there's other guys in this country and around the world that are teaching the Word of God all the time. What are the early... You ever read Acts chapter 2? There's an article on our website called The Four Daily Disciplines of the Early Church. Acts 2.42 says that the church met every day. Every day. It wasn't a burden to them. Oh, I got to fit that in my schedule. They love the Lord. They love coming and hear him teach. Uh, hear, the, hear the apostles' teaching, which is the Lord's teaching. Every day. They, they, they met together. They heard the apostles' teaching. That was first and foremost. They had fellowship with each other. The breaking of bread. They had the Lord's supper with each other. And they prayed together. Another, at, look at corporate prayer. We have our corporate prayer meeting on Thursday. The court prayer meeting is for the, this body of, the body of Christ to attend. It's important. And I've, I've talked to other Christians and pastors about this, and we, you, know, you read Acts, the first couple of chapters. Why did the church grow, and why did the church have such an impact? If you notice, before every victory, they were all in prayer together. Ministries grow. I was talking to another pastor, a good friend of mine, who I'm on intimate terms with, and he's, he said to me, you know, he's telling his, his own deacons, and he had, this, you know, he had the same problem I had. You know, they want to grow the church and everything, but they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, they didn't attend to the prayer meetings, the corporate prayer meetings, and they wonder why the church is not going to grow. It's not growing because they don't want to put anything into it. it let's watch the pastor. He was, he's the star. We'll watch him run around. No, everybody's got a gift. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody's got to be praying. And watch, look at the example of the early church. 
they grew and made a huge impact on the world. And it's because they believed in what the word of God said. They prayed, they met together, they, would, they shared things with each other, they shared their wealth with each other, they gave, they served each other, just the way you're supposed to do, just what the epistles teach us. And they were on intimate terms with the Lord as a result of their effort that they put into the relationship with God. Let me give you another ex- a- analogy. When I was growing up as a little boy, baseball, the Red Sox was in sports, you name it. I came from New England, and sports is a god. Wicked idolatry, just like college football and NASCAR in the Midwest is idolatry. Okay? When, I'm, when I was a y- young boy, I used to keep the statistics to the, for the Red Sox, batting averages, all this stuff. I mean, I was into it, everything. Then I, got, uh, then I got into music, and, you know, music was everything. Ate, slept, and drank music. That was the most important thing in my life. That was a god. Sports was a god, then music became a god. Got a girlfriend, oh, she became a god. It was the most important thing in my life. All idolatry. It wasn't until I was in my mid-20s, I had been saved about five years, that finally my priorities started to change. That's why I can be patient with a lot of people and I see in the church where they should be more into it, but I realized, like I, I myself, Hey, I didn't start off coming out of the out of the uh, you know the spiritual womb, getting born again and saved, and I was running at the you know running a hundred miles an hour right as I you know got saved. No, I flailed around for many years and wasted some years, but they are not wasted because it showed me the vanity of all these other things that I made a god of. So therefore, when I I got into the Word of God, oh, my eyes were opened. I don't know, it, I fell in love with the Word of God, and. Uh, then my life changed. My priorities, little by little, God made me, was uh, mo- uh, moving me through the Spirit to make changes based upon my knowledge of the Word of God. It caused me to be changed. Now listen to me. We come to Bible class. We come to Bible study. We pick up our Bibles. We pray. Not, uh, we pray for this, that we would be transformed. That means the way we think, the way we act, the way we speak, the way we set up our priorities in life, what we value in life, that has to stop being conformed to God's will. And God's will is found in the Word of God and is communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. So what I'm telling you is that little by little, my priorities changed. All of a sudden I looked up and here I am saying goodbye to my family and friends that come to Iowa. Okay, people thought I was out of my mind. What I could have never done that when I was in my mid to late 20s because I didn't have the capacity to. But I was able to, when I got to my, when I was about 40, I could do that. I could, I could, I could leave behind my family and friends to go and, and, and serve God. So I understand that people have to grow. But we have to, at some point, make, start making those tough decisions that need to be made. And you might lose a friend. I mean, there are friends I used to be really close with, not anymore. There are people I used to love, I still love. I don't have, I'm not on intimate terms with them anymore. Why? Because they don't value the word of God like I do. I want them to, I want, I want, I want to have friendships with people who are really into the word of God. In fact, the people who are closest to me are the people who love the word of God. And it's a simple case. Now God, the people who are closest to God the people like the Pauls, the Timothys, uh, the John, the Peter, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the prophets, Elijah, uh, all these men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, all these men. What was, what was the thing that set them apart? It was God, their relationship with God was the most important thing in their life. Abraham was willing to say goodbye to his family Ur the Chaldeans, and go to a land I'll show you. Moses, he had it all. He could have married the most beautiful woman in the world at that time, Nefereri. He left behind the, the, the wealth and the prosperity of Egypt to be suffer along with God's people. Think about that. Why? These men valued their relationship with God. They saw the invisible but real. And my prayer is that everyone who listens to my voice would understand that what's most important is their relationship with God. Don't put a bumper sticker on your car and think that that makes, makes you close to God. 
No, what makes you close to God is if you put the sweat into it. Learn your word. Be a student of the word. Obey it. It's one thing to learn. I know people who go to Bible class six times a week. I used to hang out with people like, but they never serve. They never give. They never do anything. And what is it? They don't apply it. They're not listening and responding to what the Spirit's saying in the Word of God. So you could fool yourself and go to Bible class all the time and not put it into practice. See, that. So we got to, it's learn it, obey it. This means you have to set aside time every day called sanctified time before you go to work. After I always like to go before I go to work because it, gets, it, it helped me get to my day. Pray. Every day we have to spend some time praying. When I first started doing that, trying to, and it's all about discipline. If you're not disciplined, forget it. You're not going to go anywhere in the spiritual life. You're just wasting your time. You need to be disciplined. So uh, I, I remember when I first started praying, I mean, it was, you know, 10 minutes was like a chore. Now I, I go for an hour or longer just talking to God. Why is that? Just, you, you end up growing more and more. Now, I say that. I'm not trying to brag. I'm trying to illustrate for you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to show you that you got to put the effort in. you got to be disciplined. you got to say, I'm going to do this today, and that's it. I'm going to do it, and even if I don't feel good. I mean, there's times I've been sick as a dog. I, I don't feel like t- studying. I'm, I do it anyways because I'm, now I just, I just do it. Unless I am absolutely blinded and paralyzed and... You know, I'm going to do it because I've made up my mind. That's what I'm going to do. Even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to do it. You know, you watch it, guys like Tiger Woods. They'll go out and they'll play. They become a great golfer, even though he's had some rough times lately. He's still up there in the top three. So what, what makes him good? What's Rory McIlroy? Why, why are they great golfers? They put all the work into it. Tom Brady is a great quarterback and Peyton Manning because they work harder at it than everybody else. In fact, those two guys are less of an athletes than some of these other guys, but they're smarter than everybody else because they are more knowledgeable because they do more film study and practice the little things and pay attention to the details. That's what makes them great. And listen to me, and they're great because they don't do it just once a week. They're great all the time because they're consistent and they're consistent because they're disciplined and they have what we call drive. And that's what God wants in his children. He wants us to be driven to know him. Driven to know him. To be, to be closest to him. Think about this. I want to be closest to the Lord as I can. I want to try to know him, put all my efforts into learning about him. So Moses is on intimate terms because of his habitual obedience and the Israelites were not because of their habitual disobedience. Now we must remember that at this point in the Exodus narrative, Moses had received the instructions for the construction of the tabernacle but it, it had yet to be uh, built. So therefore, this tent is not the tabernacle, but rather a smaller tent used as a meeting place for Moses, the Israelites, and God, over which the pillar of cloud stood. So this tent served some of the functions of the tabernacle that later replaced it. So therefore, this tent mentioned in verses 7 through 11 is a temporary makeshift tent which would be replaced by the tabernacle. Now this tent of meeting here in Exodus 33, 7, never held the Ark of the Covenant or any of the other sacred furniture, and it was never used for the sacrifices, and it was never anointed as the tabernacle was after its completion. So after the construction of the tabernacle, the tent mentioned here in verses 7 through 11 continued to exist, which stands in contrast to the tabernacle, which was also called the Tent of Meeting. Now Numbers chapter 2 records that the 12 Israelite tribes were organized around the tabernacle after it was completed and anointed. However, here in verses 7 through 11 of Exodus 33, we have the Israelites worshiping the Lord from afar, whereas later on, God in his grace would permit them to worship in their midst. When I say God in his grace, I mean they didn't earn it or deserve it. God gave them another chance. And this is the great thing about our God. When we sin, he gives us a second chance and a third chance, and a fourth chance. Because you have to be honest. We sin all the time. Whether we like to, we need to be honest, we do. So we we, we can think of sin. We should confess that. 
Yet God forgives us every time we go, do 1 John 1, 9, confess the sin. He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that he purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. Now, Numbers chapters 2 through 11 teaches that after the construction of the tabernacle, Aaron and the priests would minister to the Lord in the tabernacle courtyard, the holy place and the holy of holies. But now we see only Joshua is allowed near the tent of meeting. Now, by setting up the tent of meeting a good distance from the Israelite camp, Moses was teaching the Israelites the seriousness of their sin in worshiping the golden young bull. If you recall, he severely disciplined those who were unrepentant by killing the offenders. That's at the end of Exodus 32, where the Levites went about the camp and those who were still partying, he killed. They killed. They were unrepentant. So the Lord killed them. The rest were repentant, and those who survived, who were repentant, the Lord pitched his tent outside the Israelite camp to teach those who are still alive and had repented, this, you, what you did was extremely serious and wrong. I want to express to you my displeasure with what you did by putting myself outside the camp, just like you would to your kids, like if, if uh, Tyler and Cheyenne did something really bad, like they beat each other up or something. And obviously he can't hit her, so he has to take it. So let's Cheyenne beats up, or no, we have Tyler. So I'm picking on you guys. I like to have a little fun. Tyler, you know, he, he breaks uh, Cheyenne's Ken doll. Oh, she's going to kill me now. And <laughs> look at her. And, and now what's going to happen? They fight. And then Jody and Tyler come in. Go to bed. And then stay in bed the whole, you have to stay in your room the whole day. What are they trying to tell them? You screwed up big time and I'm really annoyed with you. Okay? I'm really annoyed with you. You're ticking me off. I have another name my father used to say. Another word. You really tick me off. Trying to make a point, right? God's doing that with the Israelites. He's talking to his children. You're really messed up. You need to understand. See, this is where we got to understand something here. He's trying to teach the Israelites what you did was wrong. Now, this is telling us that God is trying to instill in the Israelites his view of sin. Remember Moses came down the mountain? Moses came down the mountain, he was angry, and he was right to be. It was not sin. It was called righteous indignation. It's the same anger the Lord had. So Moses had, the, had God's view of their sin. He had the same view that God had of the Israelite sin. Now God's trying, by put, pitching his tent outside the Israelite camp, he's trying to tell the Israelites that I want you, he's trying to teach them, I want you to have mo the attitude Moses has toward that sin. And how my attitude toward that sin. I want you to be think the same way towards that sin you committed. I want you to have the same attitude. Now God wants us to, in the church age to learn from this. We need to look at sin the way God looks at it. We need to not be, we, not, we, not, we can't be compromising with sin. We got to call it the way it is. Listen to me. Uh, it's like your children. I mean, bad parents, you know, bad parents don't discipline their kids. Good parents faith, make their kids face up to what they did. It's sin. You know, you, uh, uh, also another thing is, like let's say today, homosexuality. Politically correctness says, political correctness says, you can't tell it, say it's wrong. Well, it is wrong. According to my Bible, what Jesus Christ taught, it's wrong. But we live in a day and age where we have no morals, we're amoral, and every, everything goes politically correct. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, listen to me. Uh, Jesus would have be, was offending people all over the place. Moses would have offended people all over the place. Why? Because of sin. He makes people confront their sin. He did, Jesus did this to the Pharisees. You're hypocrites. You're whitewashed sepulchers. Meaning you look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Hypocrisy. But he, was he politically correct? Oh, Jesus. You, the lo, you know, see, they, they're always loving. See, people today think love is just telling the people exactly what they want to hear. No, that's, ha that's hate. If you love somebody, if you love your kids, when they come home drunk, you know, staggering around, and they throw up all over your rug, what are you going to go? Oh, you poor little thing. You have a disease, alcoholism. No, oh, it's sin. It's not a disease. It's sin. Let me tell you something. Alcoholism is not, is not a disease, like politically correct people. It's a sin. We're going to call fornication now a, a disease? No, we like to cut sin. Devil likes to cut sin out of the vocabulary of society because it makes people confront who they are. You know, people always often wonder why people don't come to Jesus as Savior. 
I mean, Jesus made mention of this. He said, because they don't want to face up to themselves, their sin. They would rather live in the darkness. They love their sin. That's why they won't come to Jesus. You pray for people all the time, they never come to Jesus. You know why? One of the reasons, big reason, I don't want to have to, I, I love what I do. I love the sin. I love to get drunk on Friday night. I love to get drunk on Saturday night. I love to fornicate. I love to run around with crazy women and men. That's what people are like today. I can't, don't ask me to change my life. I want to keep doing what I want to do and what I want to do. And that's why they won't come to church. You know, I don't know how many times I've invited people to come to church. They won't come to church. They go, Everybody, come to church, they won't come. Hey, that's fine. You know, they, if they don't want to come, that's fine. That's between them and God. I got to keep carrying on, and you have to keep carrying on. Now, some people say, well, they don't come to the church. You know, this must not be a really good church. And, you know, you can think that. But at the Bema State, I, th- I think you're going to find otherwise if, I, if we're faithful here. You know, early church met in homes. I'm not embarrassed by it. Early on, I was kind of low. Now I like to go, yeah, I got a little house church over here. We have a little church. And then you can see people's faces going, why? What, do I have to have a building? I mean, I read Romans 16 as a house church. But some people, it's a big deal because they want to have the building because people want to be a part of something. They want to hold hands and light candles and we are the church or something. You know, I don't know. Coffee, donuts. Coffee, donuts, socializing, everything. I mean, that's nothing wrong with those things. But word of God, they teach five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And if they're teaching from the Bible, if the guy knows how to teach, no. Most churches today are an apostasy, people. That doesn't mean I don't love them. I do love them. That's why I'm pointing it out. Maybe some of these people will hear me and start making some changes. So, if you recall, God severely disciplined those who were unrepentant in Israel by killing the offenders. Then the Lord's statement in verses 3 and 5 of Exodus 33 also indicates that the Lord was greatly displeased with the Israelites. Lastly, we have the Israelites forced to worship the Lord from a distance as the tent of meeting was set up a good distance from their camp. So Moses was teaching the people how relatively distant they were from God. Though God was greatly displeased with the Israelites, he didn't cut off communication with them completely. The Israelites could inquire of him through Moses at the tent of meeting with regards to his will in a particular matter. Now interestingly, by placing the tent of meeting, I like this, this is pretty interesting. By placing the tent of meeting a good distance outside the camp, it would force an individual to demonstrate his loyalty to the Lord publicly since they would have to separate themselves from the rest of the crowd and walk out to the tent with everyone seeing them go out to it. You hear me on that one? He pitches the camp outside the, pitches himself outside the camp, the tent of meeting. That means if you wanted to go over to inquire of the Lord, you had to walk out in front of the whole camp. And, oh, there goes Bill. He's going out to the tent. And some people are embarrassed, right? Some people go, are embarrassed to go to church and have a Bible and stuff. People might see me. You know, the people, I used to think that was just with kids, kids who were concerned with what other kids say. They grow up to be adults and they're like that. They're so, you're going to that church? I mean, I bet you everybody in this neighborhood going, eh, they're going to that church again. I mean, you know, what are they doing in over there? Are they in a cult? Come on in, we're sacrificing to Bill. Pat, we're worshiping past the Bill and sacrificing cows and bleh, you hear the sheep, you know, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, eh, right. I mean, just you know, play around with them. I do that sometimes. Yeah, we they, we we, we sacrifice cows and pigs and all that stuff, and just to make light of it, because you know, why? Why? Because people, people, they'll go with the crowd because you know why? Because then they're accepted. It, they're not different. Whereas if you go to something that's less popular and maybe controversial, people don't like, because people want to be accepted. Why do you think when, G, they, when Jesus got really popular and the, and the, and the, and the Pharisees couldn't stand him, they, they said, if you follow Jesus, identify with him, we'll kick you out of the synagogue. That meant you were kicked out of Jewish society. You couldn't, if you had a business all the Jewish men would, would cut themselves off. If you had a Jewish son or daughter, nobody's son or daughter would marry your son. That meant something. That's why Jesus said, you're going to deny self and take up your cross and follow me. That meant ignominy, suffering, and being ostracized from the rest of society. But we live in a day and age, in the church, where we got to be accepted by everybody. We got to be loved by everybody. I mean, we, our country's like that. We got to love, everybody love us. I don't want any, I don't get care less if uh, Libya doesn't like us. 
I could care less if China doesn't like us. Not to digress, but let's go back to the church. I could care less if they don't like us, if people don't like us. Who cares? Didn't, that, didn't, didn't Jesus' disciples suffer because they were ostracized from society because they followed Jesus? So if you feel like you're ostracized and cut up, don't feel bad. That means it's probably a good sign that you're going in the right direction. Look, listen to me. The closer you get to the cross, the less friends you have. The closer you go to the cross, the more you get into the word of God, the more you do it, and, this, and you suffer undeservedly, and you're ostracized, and people won't accept you, won't invite you to their things, and think you're a whack job or in a cult and all that stuff. All you have to do, remember, is praise God and thank him for it. So don't be, don't, don't, don't follow. Some people are out there listening to me who don't, who are more concerned about what people think of them or their families than following Jesus and following the Bible. And I'm saying that's a, that's a joke because when you stand before Christ, you can't say, well, I didn't want to go because my, you know, my kid had a ball game. Uh, I uh, couldn't follow Jesus. Does the kid have ball games every day of the week and six, seven, 12 months of the year? Come on, I have that excuse all the time. Usually from guys, they're full of baloney, as if I didn't know. And then there's, you know, oh, I couldn't go because, you know, I had a sniffle, you know, or I, uh, I couldn't go because I was, uh, you know, I was tired. Uh, you know, you can't say, you're not going to be able to have any excuses before Jesus. It's just going to say and go, you're not, you're not even going to say that. You're not even going to say that because. You're not even going to say that. You won't say anything. It'll all, you, all, the, all the facade will be stripped away from us. We're good, and we're just going to be, and the, the Lord is able to see through everything. So let's be honest, and let's try to be more and more dedicated. If, if you're going in the right direction, don't just settle for it. Get better. Try to become even a better, more knowledgeable of your Bible, more obedient, and thus more of the character of Christ than you. Don't, just because you, you've arrived at a certain level of maturity, that doesn't mean that you've arrived. You've got to keep going. Read Paul in Philippians 3. He didn't look back. He kept going. So there's a danger. We could look back at our successes and get complacent, or we could look back at our failures and get trapped in the past because we're always looking back at the past and we never go forward. You can't win a race if you're looking behind you. Okay? You can't. Another benefit for placing the tent of meeting outside the Israelite camp was that it would demonstrate to the Israelites that Moses was chosen personally by God. Remember, previously, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord and would thus be out of the Israelite sight. They never saw Moses in close proximity to the Lord, but now with the tent of meeting outside the camp, but within sight of the Israelites, they could see for themselves Moses having a conversation with the Lord as the pillar of cloud descended upon the tent. Now in Exodus 33, 8, if you look at that, it says, and it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent that all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his tents and gaze after Moses. Notice it's not the Lord here. I think the, the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us something here. They gazed after Moses until he entered the tent. So what we see here is that with Moses, here in verse 8, it records the Israelites rising and standing whenever Moses entered the tent and would gaze after him after he entered it. Now, the events recorded in chapter 32 reveal the Israelites disrespected Moses, and they would show that disrespect for him later on. But now, here in chapter 33, verse 8, they show him great respect after the Israelites had been disciplined, disciplined by the Lord. So he's de God's delegated authority, which reveals a principle here in the church age. We don't have a Moses in our midst, but we have passed the teachers that God's raised up, delegated authority. Now, be careful. You have to show every respect to your pastor, but there's some Christians that go the exact opposite direction, and they actually make an idol out of them. You have to show respect for your pastor, but don't put him on a pedestal and, pedestal, uh, pedestal and worship him like he's, you know, like he's God himself. He's just a servant. I mean, I can always tell that when pe people say, well, I listen to, listen to Pastor so-and-so said this. Yeah, but, but what does the text say? They, always, they drop Pastor so-and-so's name because they think that, no, that's, that's an example that you, whatever he says, but he's to teach you so you can find it yourself. You know, I don't want you to sit there and go, oh, this, you know, I give you chapter and verse. I, I try to give you all these things, show you where the passages are, read them. I want you to be able to find this stuff yourself. 
I don't want you to sit there and go, well, you know, and call Pastor Bill up. Bye, Pastor Bill. What was that passage? How many hours do I have to teach before you wake up and fight it yourself? You gotta fight. So, and of course, I give him grace and I'll tell him what the passage is. But you should know it already. You should know where these things are. Why do you think I repeat? I remember one guy used to give me criticized because I repeat. He says, you know, it's like, hey, where's such and such a passage on this? Oh, I don't know. Well, if you were listening, you'd be able to find it. The repetition is so you could get it ingrained in your head where to find these things when you need to find it, when I'm not around. You know, a lot of people use pastors as crutches. I'm not your crutch. I'm, I'm giving you the food that you need so you can walk on your own, just like little babies. The mother and father feed the kid so the kid can grow up. They don't want to have a 25-year-old, a 30-year-old kid. What was that guy's uh, name? He, he, him and his brother are like adults and they're still living at home. <laughs> Oh, well, that show, show uh, what's his name? Will Farrell, and he's adult, and they're, and they're fighting. I kicked that guy out of the house for crying out loud. I mean, imagine that. Now, the point is, you're feeding the kid, you're training the kid, because you want the kid to get out on his own. It's like these two, gone at 18, baby. <laughs> and, uh, and gone at 18. Why? Train them up, feed them, clothe them, show them the right way to go. And then you should be able, they should be able to handle it life themselves because you trained them for it. That's the same thing with a pastor does. I'm here to train you for it. I'm not your, I'm not your, your guy, your, your, your personal psycho and, uh, and analyst. Oh, Pastor Bill, uh, my wife is, be a man and stop being a whip and tell her what she's supposed to be doing. Stop mouthing off at you. Oh, I couldn't say that. Well, you, got, you both need to come to Bible class. She needs to learn respect for your authority, and you need to be a man and step up and stop being a wimp. You know? <laughs> so, we see here that to rise and stand was the standard action of respect in the ancient world, which is also true, de true today in the 21st century. When the President of the United States come in, everybody stands up. And, oh, I'm not going to stand. People who do that, Disrespect God, because God has put the president as authority, whether you like him or not, or his policies, you stand up, and that's what you're supposed to do. That's called respect for the office. God installed that person in there. You stand up. When Nero came in, don't think that Paul, don't think Paul went like, oh, I'm not going to stand up for him. Oh, he stood up, showed respect, but he's the leader of the people. In fact, if you read Exodus, Acts 23, he was before the high priest, who actually was the one who railroaded Jesus, and he didn't know he was the high priest, Paul, and he spoke evil. Uh, he said, uh, you whitewashed tomb. And then the guy was beside him. The guard slapped Paul. And he says, you're going to talk that way to the high priest? And the high priest was corrupt, but he was still the ruler of the Jewish people. And Paul, what did Paul say? No, he deserved it. I don't like his policies. He's evil. No, he, Paul said, forgive me. I didn't know he was the ruler. I didn't know he was the high priest. You're not to speak evil of the ruler of your people. Yet you got Christians who disrespect the authority of the president. Disrespect the authority of the pastor. When the pastor's talking, don't you sit there and start talking. Like, Shut up! It's like with par parents and the, and the kids. What is the most obnoxious thing? The parent's talking and the kid interrupts. You know what my father would do? Bam! No, he never, he never hit us, really. My mother would be the one to crack us. My father was the good guy because he was never home. So you, know, so you hear what I'm saying? It's called respect. It's called respect. Hey, one good thing when I was raised as a Catholic, I don't know if it's true anymore because I haven't been in a Catholic church, you never, we never talked in church. If we so much as booed, moved, we would get cracked. Oh, they would he, we, we were threatened. If you, make, you embarrass me, my mother said, you embarrass me in, in this church, I'll, de I'll crack you. So we never moved. We just sat there and... Call respect. They were taught respect. When the priest is talking, shut up. Let them. Now you go. I, I went in one time. Everybody's talking. Maybe it was because it was a baptism. Well, everybody's sitting there talking, blah, blah, blah. The priest is talking. Everybody's sitting there talking. Our generation doesn't know what respect is. We don't know what respect is. We don't know it anymore. You know why? Because we were the generations that grew up with the Beatles and their long hair and revolution, the peace sign and the flowers in the hair and the dropping the acid and the, doing the LSD and playing the Beatles records backwards and uh, worshiping Jimi Hendrix and Purple Haze. And when we got that generation grew up, they taught their kids to disrespect authority. Now we have a mess. And you're wondering where it all came from? 
We got into we 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 rejected God. We rejected His Word. It's manifest that we don't have respect for authority. Right here, I mention all that because Israel and how did Israel learn to respect Moses? Here, discipline. God took them out to the woodshed. They learned to dis- they learned to respect Moses. Listen to me. If you disrespect the pastor, God's going to teach you how to te- respect the pastor. He's going to take you out to the woodshed. Count on it. If he doesn't discipline you, then you're not his kid. The fact that he does discipline you shows that he's, you're his kid. Remember that. And listen to me. Respect doesn't mean, i got to balance this because some people go the other direction. Respect doesn't mean if your pastor is a blazing drunk that you, you just let him carry on and you don't, no. That's wrong too. He needs to be, and if he's you know, running around at strip joints and stuff, that's wrong. This should be church discipline. Go to him in private. Doesn't listen, bring two more witnesses. Doesn't listen to that, bring him to the church. Doesn't listen to that, he's out. That's, that's true of anybody, whether he's a pastor or a regular, a, a lay person. So we can't go the exact, I've seen Christians go, oh, we've got to show respect for the pastor. Yeah, but you're killing the guy by not disciplining him. He's still going, doing whatever he wants to do, and he's, he's hurting himself. If you love him, you're going to confront him. Like, I would hope if I'm, like, go off and crazy with, you know, running around with some crazy floozies or something, I would hope that Titus or, you know, uh, uh, T- uh, Tony would come up to him and say, hey, Bill, what are you doing? You know? So don't go, you know, respect means, <laughs> respect for the office, but that doesn't mean you condone evil behavior, bad behavior. Remember that. So in Exodus 33, 9, look at verse, thir- verse 9. Exodus 33, 9, it says, Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. There we see the the reader is told that whenever Moses entered the tent, the uh, pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to him. Up to this point in the Exodus narrative, we've seen this expression, pillar of cloud, appear four times. The pillar of cloud, remember, during the day, and the pillar of fire at night, was a visible manifestation of the Lord's presence in the camp of the Israelites. This visible presence, or manifestation, was to guide and protect the Israelites, and also would comfort them. Now, in the church age, we have something different. Instead of being in a pillar of cloud, the Trinity indwells us in our souls. The Father indwells us, Ephesians 4, 5. The Son, Colossians 1, 27. The Spirit, 8, Romans 8, 11, And I can give you other passages. Okay? So he indwells, not a building or a tent now, or in a cloud. He indwells all of us. And that's, we need to know that because it gives us comfort. It should give us comfort and confidence. Now when the pillar of cloud arrived, the Israelites would know the meeting between Moses and the Lord had begun. And when it left, that said to everybody, meetings adjourned. So the statement in verse 10, if you look at verse 10, it says, when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of the tent. Now, when the pillar of cloud, uh, it says there in verse 10 that it indicates, this verse indicates that the Israelites could see the pillar of cloud and would thus demonstrate proper respect to the Lord's presence by bowing to the ground and worshiping him. Now, a little correction in the translation here because if you look at the New American Standard Translation, that presents a picture to us of the Israelites standing and then remaining standing. But that's not the case at all. They actually bowed down to the ground, as we'll say. The word for worship there, it's the word kava. And it's a word that means to bow and worship. Not just worship, it means to bow and worship. They weren't just sta- standing and like this. They were on the ground. They stood up and then they went hit the ground. So the, uh, this word means to bow and worship, not just worship, because it refers to prostrating oneself as a sign of honor, worship, and homage to God. Now, the stem of this word, the hithpael stem, is what we call in Hebrew grammar a reflexive factative, hithpael. And that simply means that the subject of the verb causes itself to enter a state. Now, the subject here is the Israelites, and the state is bowing in worship to God. So the stem denotes that the Israelites caused themselves to enter the state of worshiping the Lord while they were in a prostrate position. Now, verse 11, if you look at that, it says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, when it says in verse 11, it says that, that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face just as a man speaks to a friend. 
Now, remember, we saw this expression before in Exodus. Face to face. Remember, God is a deity, doesn't have a face. Okay, we know Jesus Christ it has a, a human nature. He has a face, a resurrected body, has a resurrected face, okay? But God, as to his, and his essence, and his divine essence, there's no face to deity. So when it says face to face here, it's an idiom. It's an idiom, and it expresses intimacy. So though Moses couldn't see his face or his form, he knew his presence was there. He could sense it, and the cloud said he was there, and the voice would say to him that there's someone right there. That's God. So face-to-face -face simply here means that they were on intimate terms. It means that they spoke openly with each other. It mentions their friends, not acquaintances, their friends. So it means that they spoke openly with each other, and does not contradict God's statement in verse 20 that no one could see his face and live because this idiom, face to face, is a figurative expression suggesting openness and friendship. A lot of times people say the Bible contradicts itself because they don't know these idioms. So I just proved, I just blew out of the water. One other uh, people say, oh, it's a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. That God said you can't see my face and live in verse 20, yet they speak face to face here because face to face is, is in Hebrew idiom talking about intimacy. Not saying that God has a literal face. So, stop here for a second. We're almost done. Notice it says that they spoke openly with each other. Do you know that you, hopefully you know this, you should know this, you can speak openly to God in prayer anytime you want. You need a friend to talk to? Instead of picking up the cell phone, talk to God. I'm not saying you can't talk to your friends, but I'm saying, how about talking to God first, who created you and redeemed you? You can talk to God all you want. Talk to him as a friend. Talk, say, God, how, why is this the case? You know, he talks to us through his word and circumstances and godly people, but mainly through his word. And you and I can talk to him as much as we want. Talk to him all the time. That expresses, when you are intimate in him, with him in prayer and talking to him, that's an exp that shows that you're in intimate terms with him. He's you're because it's showing that you really want to Involve him in your life when you're praying to him, talking to him, wrestling with things. You, you don't understand something? Why don't you just go to him and say, hey, I don't understand? And eventually he's going to give you an answer. And this, I'll tell you why. Sometimes he doesn't give us an answer on certain things. He wants us to walk by faith. Trust in him. So here in Exodus uh, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11, we have a stark contrast with Moses on intimate terms with the Israelites who were not. Verse 11 tells the reader that when Moses left the tent, Joshua would remain at the tent in order to guard it from any Israelite attempting to enter without authorization. That's why he's there. He's there to protect anybody from going in unauthorized. Now that Joshua guarded the tent of meaning doesn't, we need to balance this. Just because he was guarding it, that doesn't indicate that he was on a par with Moses or superior to the Israelites because the Israelites, remember, they could, could inquire of God at any time as well. They just had to go outside the camp to do it. However, it does reveal that both Moses and God trusted Joshua, who would eventually lead the Israelites into the promised land after Moses' death. So Joshua got promoted. Joshua respected Moses' authority and, of course, the Lord's authority. And he was also uh, promoted by God after Moses' death. So he was a man. That's why some, uh, you know, it's not, nothing wrong with being second in command. What happened eventually, you know, God maybe will promote you. But listen to me. And this just goes for the guys, the guys out there who think that they have the gift to pass, the teacher or evangelist. If you're not submitting to another pastor, God's never going to give you your own church. You might, try to, you might try to do it on your own, but it'll never be approved by him. Because you have to demonstrate respect for authority before God will put you in a position of authority. That's why we read in 1 Timothy 3, you know, what you have, having the gift to pass the teacher is one thing, but you have to demonstrate over an indefinite period of time that you can respect another man's authority and then God promotes you. You know, a lot of, a lot, I know some guys and uh, they, they think that they're, they got the gift or they're evangelists or pastor, but they will not, they jump around from church to church to church and they're hot to trot to go out there, but they don't know their Bible, so they're not qualified to be out there speaking for God. The more you can prepare, the better. Don't be in a rush to, if you're a man or evangelist or a pastor. Learn your Bible. The more you're prepared and know your Bible, the better a servant of God you're going to be. But if you're 
ignorant of your Bible, you're going to be a terrible servant. In fact, you could hurt the body of Christ and even the unsaved big time because of your lack of knowledge. Let me give you an analogy. If you're a doctor and you're, you, want, you go to the doctor and he's going to operate on you, you know, he's going to take out your appendix, you, you're, you're assuming this guy is trained and he's not a quack, right? You don't want somebody to work on your teeth who hasn't gone through dental school and has had some practice and sat down. Okay, you don't go to somebody who's incompetent, right? Well, you, God doesn't want his servants out there and they're incompetent to do the job. The more you know the word of God, the better you'll be. The more you demonstrate, the more, you are, more Christ-like character you have in you, the better equipped you are to serve the body of Christ or if you're an evangelist, to go out and serve the unsaved. So, Joshua did not live in this tent, but rather his tent was nearby so that he could serve as its custodian. So he lived outside the Israelite camp. He's described in this verse as a young man, which does not mean he was immature, but rather that he was much younger than Moses. And of course, Moses was well into his 80s here at this time, and Joshua was about 40 or so. So uh, we come to the end of this, and what we need to learn here as we wrap it up is this. Intimacy with God is being... Moses' intimacy... With God is contrasted to the uh, the lack of intimacy on the part of the Israelites with their God, with, it, with with the God of Israel. So this is teaching us: we want to be like Moses, not like the Exodus generation. And to be intimate with God demands effort and work and maintain and setting priorities, which make Him first. Make Him first. Learning Him, learning His Word, learning His ways, and putting these things into practice that we learn. And the more Christ-like character you have, the more you'll be on, on more intimate terms with the Lord. We can be, show our intimacy with God by prayer. Learning and studying the word is one thing and obeying it, but there's also prayer where we could speak to him. So there's a relationship that we can have. We don't want to be acquaintances because people who are acquaintances of ours don't know a lot about us and we don't know a lot about them. So therefore, we want to be friends. The word friends is used flippantly like the word love today. Friends means there's an intimacy there. There's, a, as I mentioned with that definition I gave to you that's going to be on our article that I ha came up with, intimacy is a close, familiar, and usually affectionate or loving or personal relationship with another person or group. In relation to people, intimacy is a close association with a detailed knowledge or a deep understanding of a person. God wants us to have a detailed knowledge of his will, his ways, what he's provided for us, what he wants us to do. That's what God wants from us. He already knows us intimately. It's up to us now to draw close to him and respond to the grace and love that he's bestowed upon us. So let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this time to study your word. We pray that the class would be a great blessing to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you and minister to your people. Father, we just thank you again for all the blessings that you've given to us in this country. And, uh, and uh, we thank you for the, not only the temporal blessings, but also the spiritual blessings, our relationship with you and fellowship with you and your Son and the Holy Spirit and with other members of the body of Christ. We thank you for everyone that listened to this class here this morning. We pray that they would be benefited by it, that they would be transformed by the message, that they wouldn't merely hear the word, but that it would sink deep into their souls and would be watered, and that they would apply what they've heard and start making changes if they need to. For those who are on the right road, give them encouragement, but keep them from being complacent. Humble us all, Father. Show us that we're no, by no means arrived, that we need to keep push, pushing forward, pressing on, forgetting those things that are behind, and looking forward uh, to that upward call in Christ Jesus, the reward of a greater intimacy in the eternal state. Father, we thank you and praise you for who and what you are, who and your Son is in the Spirit, what you've done for us through both your Son and your Spirit in the past, or doing, doing for us now, and will do for us in the future. We thank you again, Father. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. And uh, as we do each Sunday, and for those who are on PalTalk or through the website or listening in, you can give to us. Uh, you can go on our website and there's the mailing address there, the P.O. box, and all you can uh, use PayPal if you want. It's up to you. It's between you and God. This offering is obviously between you and God. The Holy Spirit's got to guide you in what you're going to give, if anything. So uh, we do know that the Word of God says in Galatians 6, 6, that those who are taught the word of God are to share all good things with them who teach them the word of God. And uh, those who proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel. So 
uh, this is very important we understand that we do have an obligation to give to those who are teaching us the word of God. So let's pray for this offering. Father, we pray that this offering would be given out of proper motivation, out of love and appreciation for you and your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that it would produce many thanksgiving to you, that those who give would be blessed by the giving because your son taught that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Father, we thank you for giving us this great privilege to provide for the, the needs of this ministry. And, and we pray again that they, our needs would be met. We thank you for being so faithful to us through all of our adversities and trials and tribulations. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, what we're going to do for a song here, uh, let's, we're going to do um, page 167. Unbelievable. <laughs> this thing is so tangled up. It's unbelievable. <sighs> Got to do something about that. <laughs> yeah, I did it. All right, page 160, page 167. Excuse me. Well, there ain't no one like Jesus Christ, my Lord. Oh, his word is pure and sharper than a sword. I'm going to love my keeping his almighty word. Well, there ain't no one like the God, man, Savior, King. He died, was raised, and now did lost its sting. I'm going to give him all my praise for him I sing. Oh, yeah, he's the one who made me whole. In my heart, he filled the hole. I'm gonna love him with all my heart and all my soul. Oh, I'm gonna love him, love him, love him day and night. Oh, he's the one, the one who gave me sight. I'm gonna serve him with all my strength and it is might. Oh yeah Well there ain't no one like the Lamb who's on the throne He's the one who is the stumbling stone world is ever known. Oh yeah, he's the one who made me whole. And in my heart, he filled the hole. I'm gonna love him with all my heart and all my soul. I'm gonna love him, love him, love him day and night. The Father's only Son His cross has given us the victory The battle's won And now I'll rest in all the work He's done Oh yeah, He's the one Who made me whole And in my heart He filled the hole
you're dismissed.